Welcome to Around the Empire. I'm your host, Joanne Leon. Around the Empire podcast is listener-supported independent media. Please pitch in patreon.com slash around the empire or paypal.me slash around the empire pod. Also, please subscribe to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash around the empire. Today, we bring you a swap cast where two podcasts collaborate and publish the work on both podcast channels. And today I'm talking with the host of Foreign Policy Podcast, Kyle Anzalone, on the firing of Trump's National Security Advisor, John Bolton. We recorded this on September 14th, 2019. All right, everyone. Well, I'm Kyle Anzalone, and welcome to a Swapcast episode of the Foreign Policy Focus podcast, which I am the host, and the Around the Empire podcast, and the host of that is Joanne Leon. So, you know, we're kind of doing co-hosting duties today, but I'll try to get us kicked off here a little bit by saying that me and Joanne are going to be talking about John Bolton, uh, a little bit of the legacy, some of the, you know, more historical terrible things that the guy has done and uh, gleefully reflect on his firing. So Joanne, I don't know if you have anything more than that to add. Well, I would just like to join in you, your celebrations and uh, we'll have to put some celebratory sound bites in here. I think. No, I was really happy, very happy to hear about it. Although, you know, of course I'm, sort of holding my breath as to who's going to take his place. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I'm glad he's gone. I, I think it's a good thing all around. I think it would be hard to find someone worse, although they maybe could find someone almost as bad. So we'll we'll have to see. Right. Well, maybe let's start off here with the firing. I know you have a clip put together of Trump's uh, statement talking about John Bolton's firing and I'm sure everybody in the audience, even if you have seen it, it's just so enjoyable to hear Trump talk so negatively about John Bolton that I think it's worth it to go ahead and uh, play that clip here and then me and Joanne could talk a little bit about what happens. Yeah, this is a clip of Trump and he's sitting in the Oval Office uh, responding to questions about why he fired Bolton. The talks with the Taliban are dead. So... John is somebody that I actually got along with very well. He made some very big mistakes when he talked about the Libyan model for Kim Jong-un. That was not a good statement to make. You just take a look at what happened with Gaddafi. That was not a good statement to make. And it set us back. And frankly, uh, he wanted to do things not necessarily tougher than me. You know, John's known as a tough guy. He's so tough, he got us into Iraq. That's tough. And, uh, but he's uh, somebody that I actually had a very good relationship with, but he wasn't getting along with people in the administration that I consider very important. And uh, I hope we, we've left in good stead, but maybe we have and maybe we haven't. I have to run the country the way we're running the country. We're doing very well. We're respected all over the world again. Who are your top? Who are your top? Who are your top picks for for to replace? Well, I have five people that want it very much. I mean, a lot more than that would like to have it. But there are five people that I consider very highly qualified, good people I've gotten to know uh, over the last three years. And uh, we'll be announcing somebody next week. But we have some very highly qualified people. But we were set back very badly when John Bolton talked about the Libyan model. And he made a mistake. And as soon as he mentioned that, the Libyan model, what a disaster. Take a look at what happened to Gaddafi with the Libyan model. And he's using that to make a deal with North Korea. And I don't blame Kim Jong-un for what he said after that. And he wanted nothing to do with John Bolton. And that's not a question of being tough. That's a question of being not smart to say something like that. So I wish John the best. We actually got along very well. I'm sure he'll, you know, do whatever he can do to, uh, you know, what, spin it his way. Uh, John came to see me the night before. In fact, I think a lot of you people are out there waiting for me to get on the helicopter. I'm sure you have a shot somewhere along the line. And he sat right in that chair. And I told him, John, you have too many people, you're not getting along with people, and a lot of us, including me, disagree with some of your tactics and some of your ideas. 
and I wish you well, but I'd like you to submit your resignation. And he did that. And I really, I know he's going to do well. I hope he's going to do well. And I wish him well. Yeah, so I think he kind of tells us, it gives us a pretty good idea of why the guy is gone. He doesn't give us specifics about why he's gone. But um, foremost in his mind is that Bolton has made some really dumb statements. His foreign policy and his tactics, uh, I don't know, maybe their overall strategy lines up, but their tactics definitely don't. And, you know, he focuses a lot. He still hasn't forgiven Bolton for sabotaging that North Korea summit that he just completely wrecked, apparently. And the fact that he brought up the Libya model, which Trump finds particularly offensive because, you know, Libya is probably probably Obama's biggest foreign policy failure. It's one that's easy to point to. And, you know, it was very embarrassing. He embarrassed him a lot. But so it's interesting that that's the one that is that seems to be foremost in his mind. Yeah, I mean, I thought that was interesting that he did highlight Libya, especially or the you know bringing up the Libya Libya model with the North Korean talks, because yeah. you know that hasn't been this news as much lately. I mean, we had the Trump Kim meeting at the DMZ where John Bolton was marooned to Mongolia and Tucker Carlson and uh, you know attended instead, uh, but for the most part, you know, the U.S. then carried out some war games. With with South Korea throughout the month of August that really upset the North Koreans because it was simulating the occupation of their country after a South Korean takeover. And so it didn't seem like those talks were really going anywhere at that point. And everything in the recent news has been around the Taliban and, right. you know, a potential peace deal and stuff like that. And so I do want to talk more on the show about John Bolton's, uh, you know, hostility towards North Korea and what he's done to wreck, you know, the potential Korean peace. But, uh, you know, for now, you know, maybe just to say recently, Joanne, do you think that the Taliban uh, peace talks played into it at all? And what of this, uh, you know, Camp David meeting that was alleged to happen that, you know, according to some of the neocons and foreign policy establishment folks on Twitter was, you know, the greatest affront to the 9-11 victims ever? Yeah, um, I expected him to focus on that because with the timing, it's pretty clear that that's the thing. That was the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will, and that probably why they got into a fight and why Bolton is gone. I think there are other factors in the timing as well, but that's the obvious one. Uh, Trump seems to have reversed himself on the Camp David summit that he had planned. But, you know, he he doesn't focus on that in, in his, you know, words to the press, which is, is curious, I think. Now, I just saw an interview with um, Aaron Maté and John Kiriakou, and I had listened to a couple of things. Kiriakou came up with an article in June, I think it was mid-June, who said, you know, that Bolton was on his way out. So we, and Kyle and I had done an, uh, an episode on this, around the empire back then. So we, we really weren't surprised that, that Bolton was on his way out. And just to confirm that Bolton was definitely on his way out, um, he had already been sidelined. Let's just listen to this clip by Washington Post, Carol Morello. As Zalmay Khalilzad, the State Department Special Envoy for peace talks with the Taliban, as he came up with a draft agreement. Bolton asked to see a copy of it, reportedly, and they refused to send him over a draft of the agreement. They said if he wanted to, he could come in and read it, but they would not give him a copy to take out. Or He just didn't think that uh, the, the deal that was being negotiated by Khalilzad uh, was a good one, and he was quite open and vocal about that. So there was a point last month when there was a meeting at the White House uh, between all the principals, really, uh, in national security in the administration. And initially, Bolton was not even invited to it. You had the head of the CIA, you had Mike Pompeo, you had a number of officials, but not John Bolton. And Bolton's aides apparently 
appealed to uh, Mick Mulvaney, the chief of staff, and so he finally did get to come, but he had to sort of, you know, push his way in to this meeting, so he was completely being sidelined. The acting National Security Advisor is Charlie Kupperman, um, and the fact is the President of the United States asked John Bolton last night for his resignation. It was delivered today. John Bolton's priorities and policies just don't line up with the President's, and any sitting president has the right to put someone in that position that can carry out his agenda. That became no longer tenable, so the president made a change. But the thing that, the new thing that Kiriakou brought to this was that the problem was that Bolton was leaking. And I actually suspected this because it was explosive news that this Camp David summit had been planned and now it was called off and it sort of like burst into the news. And I suspected that maybe Bolton uh, helped with, with that leak. So supposedly Kiriakou said that uh, based on some friends of his that are White House sources that talked to him in June, told him that Bolton was on his way out. And I guess they've now told him that, that Bolton was leaking and he wasn't just leaking. He was going and griping to the media uh, especially when he disagreed with Trump and that that had really uh, that made Trump that really pissed him off. Um, and what's interesting is that there were some people, some press, maybe the press pool, they were at the White House and they actually captured some video of Bolton like right after he went in, because I guess it was uh, the evening beforehand, Trump and Bolton reportedly had some kind of a uh, a disagreement, you know, like a, a strong disagreement. And Trump claims that he asked for his resignation and Bolton claims that he offered it. And then the, the next morning when Bolton came into the White House, he gave him his two sentence, uh, very terse resignation letter. And, you know, that's when the news broke. So immediately after that, Bolton went outside of the White House and they have video of him on his cell phone. And I guess some people in the media said, yeah, he was calling us, uh, telling us that, no, he wasn't fired, he quit. And, and of course, that became a meme and a, a whole nother thing about the whole thing. But, you know, so that, but it seems to bolster the idea that, that Bolton was, um, you know, he was in uh, good with some of the conservative media and he was, uh, it was a habit of his to, call them and to leak. And that's like a cardinal sin with the Trump White House. You know, he's been through right from day one in his administration. He had these leaking problems of people close to him. And I can totally see why that would really set him off. So it wouldn't surprise me if that was sort of like the spark. I think Bolton was going to be gone, but I, I think that it makes sense to me that that was the spark. Uh, but I also think there are other factors, Kyle, you know, I think that Bolton was sabotaging Trump's foreign policy. Pompeo is playing a, a much more sophisticated game, and he seems to he seems to be going along with Trump's foreign policy. At least he, um, I I don't think that he's just going along. I think he's trying to influence him, but he's not doing it the way that you know Bolton's bull in a china shop way of doing it, and. Bolton, as we know, Bolton's been sidelined for months. The Afghan peace talks, whether or not Trump changed his mind on the whether the Trump the Camp David summit was a good idea or not, it was a big embarrassment the way it was announced. And he's clearly still bothered by the way that uh, Bolton scuttled the North Korea deal, and that was very sudden too. You know, they the food was on the table, wasn't it? So we know that something happened to scuttle it like very quickly. And then, but there's more, you know, the Iran maximum pressure strategy is clearly not working. You know, they're trying to put a good face on it, but it's definitely not working. The Venezuela coup attempt and Bolton was one of the, one of the faces of that, him and Marco Rubio. I mean, that was an embarrassing failure. We also just had Israel bombing Iraq, putting American troops in, in some real danger we have, uh, it seems like every week, another troop is killed in Afghanistan. And, you know, Yemen is, is, is an embarrassing disaster, too. So I suspect that 
all of that, uh, you know, had something to do with the deterioration uh, between Bolton and Trump. I, I think he was out and they were just waiting for the right time to do it because the other problem that Trump has and the Democrats have uh, capitalized on this is, you know, how many people he's fired. And so this is this will be his fourth national security advisor in three years. And I think he's sensitive about that, too. So he doesn't just want to fire Bolton. And th there's some question to me as to why he even hired Bolton. You know, I suspect that there was some um, strong influencing factors in that. Maybe Sheldon Adelson, maybe Netanyahu. And, you know, he may have been sort of tried trying to balance that. But his relationship with Netanyahu seems to be deteriorating, too. Um, and then the last thing, and I, I do think this has something to do with timing, is that UN, you know, the big week at the UN is coming up. It's always, what, it, the second week in September or the third, whatever. It's coming soon. <clears throat> and Trump, you know, he'll go and give a speech there. But he has also said publicly that he might do a sideline meeting with Iran there. And Iran has openly said they won't deal with Bolton at all. So I think that, that Trump, you know, he's got an election coming up. Um, he's starting to see who his opponents might be. I think his internal polling is probably terrible. And he realizes he has really no foreign policy wins. Yeah, he hasn't gotten us into any new wars, but, you know, he hasn't really kept any of his promises there. And, you know, a lot of people argue whether he was, you know, being genuine when he claimed that he wanted to get us out of some wars and whether or not he was, I think he realizes that those promises were important to his base and are important to his reelection. He needs some wins and he needs to make some deals and all that stuff. And he hasn't done that. And um, I think he saw Bolton as his, uh, as a, the impediment to that. I think he's going all in with Pompeo. He thinks Pompeo can, make that happen. I think Pompeo is a very ambitious man. I think he's politically ambitious. And, um, you know, I think that all it needed was a spark for Trump to publicly fire him and he did it. Yeah. So uh, you know, going back to the, the clip that Trump has of, you know, it, what he's saying, as you pointed out before the show, uh, you know, I think we have Trump as probably his most honest and, and what's most prevalent on his mind when he's just kind of rambling like that and says yeah. things over and over a couple of times. And the thing he keeps going over is that it was very stupid of John Bolton to say the thing about the Libya model. So that tells me that Trump understands a couple of things, what the issue with the Libya model was. There, Muammar Gaddafi turned over an entire nuclear weapons program that he didn't actually have nukes. And I don't know how close Libya was to making nukes and how serious he actually was about that. But anyways, you know, it had some equipment that could potentially be used to make nuclear weapons, gave that over to the United States to, you know, what they call come in from the cold which means like rejoin the international order, get sanctions taken off you. Basically, you know, go from being the North Korean hermit kingdom status to a normal place. Well, that happens. And then a couple of years later, uh, Barack Obama takes over and bombs Gaddafi's army and gets the guy, you know, killed in a very brutal way on the side of the road. And so by that, the North Koreans know that they can't hand over their entire nuclear weapons program to the United States or risk being attacked. And then a lot of people point to Saddam Hussein as another leader who uh, basically had the same thing happen to them. So Donald Trump understanding that portion of American like kind of foreign policy history, especially since it's so recent, is probably pretty important. It also says that he understands, you know, that Kim Jong Un knows this as well. And so hopefully there, then, you know, he does go to this kind of step-by-step -step model that seemed to be agreed to at the Singapore summit. And I believe John Bolton was already national security advisor at the time, but it was relatively early in, in his time. And I think the, the meeting had already been planned beforehand. And so, you know, John Bolton was kind of sidelined for that. I remember a couple pictures of John Bolton at Singapore and he was always off in the background and with the you know, most upset looking face you ever see with that ridiculous mustache. <laughs> By the way, uh, Moon of Alabama wins for the best headline uh, about John Bolton's firing, talking to, calling, comparing John Bolton so, to Yosemite Sam. 
<laughs> so that, that was a, a personal favorite of mine in this whole John Bolton firing scenario. But, uh, you know, to get back to the North Korea stuff, so if that all happens and it seems like the agreement at Singapore is in an ordered number where the countries are going to build diplomatic relations and establish maybe a little bit of sanctions relief before the denuclearization process started. And then John Bolton comes out, Libya model, Libya model, Libya model. And then North Koreans say, well, no way. If they're bringing up the Libya model and they know what happened in Libya, then, you know, they're they're just going to try to screw us. And North Korea also had a, a past with John Bolton as a member of the Trump administration. I don't think he was probably the spearhead of, you know, kind of Dick Cheney and the rest of them in the Bush administration that ruined the agreed framework deal that North Korea had with and made with the Clinton administration. But he was certainly a part of that. So, you know, he brings that up. They, they already know he's killed nuclear deals in the past. He was against the uh, anti-ballistic missile treaty with Russia as well in the Bush administration. So I, I'm sure for, you know, North Korea, the, the hiring of John Bolton and the fact that he's coming out and saying Libya model is a huge red flag for them. And so when it comes to Hanoi, he, at the last minute, I guess bullies Trump into, you know, proposing a deal to Kim Jong-un. And I'm sure this was somewhat like uh, what happened with Ukraine, uh, you know, in like, I think, 2013, 2014, when they went to, you know, go sign a deal with the EU and then they, you know, came up with an entirely different deal. Well, that's pretty much, you know, I think what happened here at Hanoi, where there seemed to be some agreement between at least the two working level talk teams that, you know, this would be a step by step thing. And then Trump shows up at Hanoi and says that North Korea must get rid of all of its WMDs before any sanctions are relieved. And of course, the North Koreans turned right around and went home. And a, you know, a lot of people attribute that to John Bolton, and, and I think that seems from the reporting correct. I mean, you have to blame Trump because he could have put forward the other deal. I mean, he is the president of the United States and pretty much has unilateral war making in, in you know international powers at this point. I don't think there's really anything that the president can't do as far as if he wants to make peace or start wars. It, it seems like at this point they're just going along with it. So Trump absolutely could have done that, but it was the advice of John Bolton. And since, uh, talks have gone nowhere. It's been a very disappointing year, one that really could have seen a lot of uh, movement towards peace on the Korean Peninsula has just been hampered uh, with this you know continued maximum pressure campaign and John Bolton undermining the deal. So yeah. I, I do see, like, of all the things that could potentially happen now that John Bolton is gone, uh, in, especially when you say that the, you know, the two potentials are Steve Begum and uh, Colonel Douglas McGregor, these are two people who I think would support uh, you know, a uh, deal in North Korea uh, rather than, you know, any of the other hots like Fred Flights, uh, whose name I've heard floated here, too. So that, you know, that's very scary. But Joanne, I don't know if you want to pick up from there. Yeah, I, I think that uh, the other I forget whether I mentioned this or not, but the in Kiraku's most recent interview, you know, there's supposedly this list of five names of people who are potential national security advisors and Trump had promised to appoint someone, I think this coming week. Uh, since then, some rumors have come out that uh, Pompeo is possibly going to act as national security advisor and secretary of state a la, you know, Kissinger. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't know whether that's true or not, but you know, we'll see. But the two names that Kiriakou said are really in the running are, as you said, Stephen Began and Dunk McGregor. Now, McGregor, I mean, while I would, I don't obviously don't agree with everything the guy says, but from a foreign policy standpoint, he's most in line with my, um, my views. And he's a favorite guest of Tucker Carlson. And the two of them, and you can go back to Kyle and my, uh, I'll link in the show notes, uh, previous podcast on this subject, Bolton, I mean, they systematically destroyed John Bolton on the Tucker Carlson show. And then on the night that, uh, that I guess the night after Bolton was fired, they gloated. They did like this montage of all the <laughs> negative things they had said about John Bolton. And they, and then Tucker brought McGregor back on and um, McGregor laid out, what he thought the path forward was for Trump. 
but he didn't sound to me like a person who was actually in the running who had been approached. Now, I don't know. That was just my, my sense of it. Uh, Stephen Began, and on, on the other hand, I don't really know anything about the guy, but he's the special representative to North Korea. And if he is being considered for this job, and if Trump is, you know, bringing out the topic as foremost in his mind, North Korea, it makes sense to me that he would choose this guy. And Kiriakou said he thinks that he's really the, the front runner. So, again, that says to me that Trump wants this deal with North Korea. There have been plenty of rumors that he thinks he could get a uh, Nobel Peace Prize for that, although I don't, I don't know whether he will. I think the establishment overall is so um, negative toward Trump, I don't know if they'd ever give it to him. But he, at the very least, it could be a major foreign policy win. And, you know, we have to remember that China and Russia are part of that whole gig, too. So they're, we don't even know what kinds of talks he's he's having with them. But anyway, back to Began, you know, if he's going to be the, the national security advisor, it sounds to me like, you know, Trump, again, is focusing on the thing that he thinks he can get. And um, if I were Trump and I knew that UN week was coming up, and if I planned to have a couple of UN sideline meetings with two extremely disgruntled people who I want to do some talks with, like North Korea and like Iran, um, I would be very wary that John Bolton would step in and throw some kind of a bomb and blow, blow up any possible uh, chances of any kind of a talks having any success. And why? Well, because he's done it before, right? And he's done it like, really quickly. The way he blew up that North Korea summit was really kind of stunning. Yeah, I'm with you all the way on uh, North Korea there. And like uh, you said, that that's U.S. Special Envoy who could be uh, promoted, uh, Stephen Began, or Begum, I forget how you say his name. Anyways. Yeah, actually, let me get that. I so think we, he it's is. Be, it's Begun, B-I-E-G-U-N. Begun. I guess yeah. it's Begun. I hope we're saying it right. Anyway. Sorry Anyways. if we're not, Mr. Began. <laughs> yeah. I, I think he's only, like, uh, good on North Korea. From what I, I've read, I think he's a hawk on Russia and some other things as well. Uh, but at the very least, he has, you know, put forward the idea of doing a kind of freezing uh, Korea's nuclear weapons program and then relieving sanctions from there as a potential agreement and path forward with North Korea, which at least seems practical. And, and so on that end, it seems like a good thing, but I don't know if he's actually, uh, you know, going to be good on Iran. Uh, I'm a little bit more skeptical with the whole Iranian talks happening. Uh, there's a few reasons for it. First of all, Trump has always been bad on Iran. Uh, that I don't think was in any way an influence of John Bolton. Now, uh, of course, the previous, you know, people in Trump's administration, I think all Mattis, Tillerson, and H.R. McMaster were more opposed to Trump leaving the Iranian nuclear deal. And so I'm sure having a national security advisor that, you know, was in favor of it and not opposed to it, it, you know, helped encourage Trump to leave the nuclear deal and place all these sanctions in the maximum pressure campaign against Iran. But at the same time, I think those were Trump's instincts on his own. And I think Pompeo is in line there as well. And so I'm not quite as optimistic about Iran for that reason. And also from the you know point of view of the Iranians, you know they keep saying that we're not going to talk to Trump until the sanctions are uh, reversed. And I understand why they I would they the for the deal to like even be renegotiated for them um I think it would have to go back to the start of the JCPOA because they already gave up so much I don't think they have any you know, what else are they going to give up uh possibly that's not any sort of just token concession that I'm sure the Democrats will undermine even if it's just you know giving Trump a little something to save face all the Democrats will go oh it was just the old deal because it's going to be campaign season uh, so I really can't see anything getting done for political reasons in the U.S. I don't think uh, Iran is very invested and I don't think Trump is in, as invested in kind of smoothing things over with Iran as he has North Korea. Yeah I agree with that and another event that I kind of forgot at the exact same time that Bolton was uh, submitting his resignation, there was a press conference. Mike Pompeo and Steven Mnuchin, the uh, Secretary of Treasury, and Bolton was actually supposed to be at that press conference. Um, you know, I'm not even sure what the topic of it was because it got hijacked by the Bolton firing. 
But Pompeo and Mnuchin were clearly almost gloating um, that it's very clear that they were very happy that Bolton had been gone. Um, and, you know, Pompeo said it had a couple notorious statements like, I'm never surprised. He said, and he made some statements about how, you know, the president's cabinet has to carry out the president's agenda. And that was pretty interesting. Now, it was also interesting because they doubled down on their Iraq, on sorry, their Iran policy. Mnuchin said, you know, he said that Pompeo and himself and Trump are totally on the same page on Iran and the maximum pressure campaign uh, is still on and it's working, which it's not. Um, so, yeah, they sort of reinforced that Iran is, um, they're still all in on pressuring Iran. Now, I don't know if, I mean, there have been some rumblings and maybe even some public statements that, yeah, Iran won't talk to Trump until the sanctions are rolled back. But there's also been talk about how they wouldn't necessarily have to be formally rolled back, that the other option that Trump has is to look the other way and allow Iran to, um, I forget what it is, like one and a half or three million barrels per day, export that many barrels per day, and that that would allow them to, you know, at least have a minimum keep their economy functioning and that they, they could work together if, if he did that. So I'm not entirely sure that he would have to publicly roll back the sanctions. You know, I think he's still, I don't know if he's very optimistic about it, but I think he still thinks that he could renegotiate the JCPOA and then come out and say, look what I did. Uh, I brought the Iran deal back and it's a bigger and better deal than Obama ever did. And it's a good deal while Obama was a bad deal and blah, 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 blah. So, you know, I think he's still in the back of his mind, hoping he can do something like that. Uh, and maybe that's what he's going to approach in the sideline meeting at the UN. Um, but I don't know. Yeah. It's that's, that's a much tougher one, Kyle, because he, he was always on, he always had a really wrong headed attitude toward that policy to begin with in my in my view yeah I, I wanted to touch on venezuela at least you know a little bit because i guess in north korea where you had john bolton who seemed to be going against trump's instincts and trump's foreign policy and then iran where you have bolton going uh you know in line with trump's instincts and foreign policy i guess venezuela is a little bit in the middle where I think Trump maybe ideally could have gotten on board with a regime change effort in Venezuela, but he didn't seem particularly inclined or interested in the region. But after Bolton took over the Trump policy towards Venezuela, uh, heated up and it did quickly. Uh, we had you know probably a famous speech that will be remembered from this. Uh, you know, John Bolton's uh, career as national security advisor will be the tro uh, Troika of Tyranny speech. Where you know he said that these evil regimes, uh, Maduro in Venezuela, Castro in the Communist Party in Cuba, and uh, who I is think it? Nicaragua. And, yeah, Nicaragua. Nicaragua and the communist government there are all the threats of you know kind of and against the United States, and we have to take care of these regimes. And then you know the U.S. as Joanne mentioned before launches a coup attempt. So I don't know if you have more to add or where do you think the Trump <clears throat> policy goes from here. Here I kind of see happening maybe more of what you suggested with Iran, where the U.S. could uh, just kind of stop enforcing stuff. I guess the politics in the U.S. may be a little bit more favorable towards that, where in Iran, I think the Democrats would really throw it in Trump's face if he started to relieve the maximum pressure campaign or took an agreement too close to the JCPOA, where in Venezuela, if he you know maybe just stopped enforcing so many sanctions and start looking the other way, uh, things could uh, at least normalize a little bit. Well, in this case, I think that I, I don't think Trump really cared very much about Venezuela. That was clearly Bolton's thing, and I'm not quite sure who else they were trying to appease. Uh, for them to, you know, pu do this public coup attempt and go all in on it, which turned out to be extremely embarrassing. 
uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. But I would suspect that, uh, uh, let me just say also, at the same time that this was happening and people were talking about a possible military intervention against Venezuela, but, I mean, pretty much everyone from the military part of the, the field there was saying, no, don't do it, because, you know, it, it would just be a terrible mistake, and it would also turn our allies in the region against us. So, like, nobody's going to be with us on this. So, you know, we I think that Trump has probably been advised and would be more inclined to do the slow burn long term, you know, tactics against Venezuela, which is what Obama did. He, you know, he declared them like a national emergency or some ridiculous thing like that. And the sanctions have been on for quite a long time now. And, you know, so they tried the big coup attempt against Chavez in like 2002 and that failed. It was actually reversed because it succeeded. And then they were required to reverse it because of the uprising of the people. And um, I think that Trump would be more inclined to revert to that sort of long-term um, regime change policy. I, I don't think he wants any overt regime change wars. And I, I don't know how he got talked into that one. I'm also curious about what's going to happen to Elliot Abrams, who was probably brought in by by Bolton. But the curious thing was that Trump, I think I, I don't know if he mentioned Venezuela when he was talking about Bolton's failings, but um, then the very next day after he, you know, put out his infamous tweets about firing Bolton, he put out another one the next day saying, oh, by the way, on Venezuela, you know, it wasn't that I uh, was against Bolton's, you know, you know, goal to overthrow Maduro, um, I'm even tougher than him. So he's sort of like, I, everybody just sort of cringed about that. And that, I suspect, was strictly political. Um, you know, I think somebody probably said to him, you know what, you're going to lose Florida if you uh, if you go soft on Venezuela. I, I think that was probably a polit political thing. Plus, it's just his ego, his tough guy ego. So um, that's pretty much all, all I have to say. I think it's extremely foolish and counterproductive. And um, again, all of these things are never isolated. You have the involvement and the influence of China and Russia in Venezuela, too. So, you know, I think they're going to they're going to try to work something out. Um, and they, you know, like. You can put pressure on one country and then China and Russia can push back, not only with their own policies, but also Syria, also Venezuela, also Iran, and even Afghanistan, I believe. So it's it's really complicated. But I suspect that Trump is going to back off on Venezuela and revert to the longer term murderous sanctions, if you ask me. Um, but, yeah, I do think that's what he's going to do. Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. Not that having like a, a slow burning amount of sanctions on Venezuela is a good thing, but uh, certainly better than an invasion of that country. Uh, a couple things uh, about, you know, this that I just wanted to, to talk about is how many of these policies I think are going to be destructive, like in perpetuity, uh, you know, possibly the Hanoi summit, but that could get turned around. But I'm thinking of things like labeling the IRGC, a terrorist organization and how many more sanctions have been applied. And now anytime there's any cargo going in and out of Iran, I guess the U.S. Could could just say, oh, it's tied to the IRGC and try to seize it. So, that, you know, that creates quite a bit of problems for the Iranian economy. And, you know, those sanctions, they are turning pretty murderous now as well. Uh, you know, putting the course that we're now on on Venezuela, getting rid of the Iran nuclear deal, uh, a big highlight, uh, undoing the positive things that uh, Obama Oh yeah, Obama did with Cuba. You know, these are all things that happened while John Bolton was a national security advisor from Trump. And another big one 
and, and you know this is the the last you know one I really had in mind to talk about, and that is Iran or not Iran, Russia, where you know Trump uh, walked out of the uh, intermediate nuclear forces agreement, uh, the treaty that got rid of an entire class of nuclear weapons, really limited nuclear stockpiles, uh, all the intermediate range missiles, so it, it largely taking Europe out of the crosshairs of a nuclear war by agreeing to this treaty. Uh, I think that was Reagan, right? Or was it Bush? Uh, right there towards the end of the Soviet Union in a treaty with Gorbachev, got rid of all these uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear missiles. And, uh, you know, now another nuclear weapons deal undone with Russia by John Bolton. So I guess I don't know if I see the U.S. reentering that deal, but I did read that Trump had put John Bolton in head of, uh, you know, renegotiating the new START treaty with Russia, which is set to expire, I believe, in February of 2021. And so, you know, what happens there in those negotiations is extremely important. And having now, I guess, somebody other than John Bolton uh, leading those, I, I can't think of a worse man to lead a, a new arms uh, control treaty with Russia than John Bolton. So I think it's probably yeah, totally. a positive sign that he has gone for that reason. Yeah, I agree with you totally on that. Uh, and I hadn't even, I mean, there are so many things. I mean, Bolton is just, he's a bull in a china shop. And he's, yeah, he's Mr. Tough Guy, but he's also, you know, he, if you look at the way that China, Russia, Iran, uh, even Syria, I mean, they're playing chess when this guy's playing checkers. So I, I think that Pompeo, as bad as he is, I, I think he's smarter than Bolton, a lot smarter. I think he's still a neocon and, uh, you know a very destructive guy, but I, I think that this requires a much more sophisticated player or players. And with Bolton out of the way, you know, hopefully they can be a little bit more, more nuanced. Trump, I think his anti-interventionist thing is at least somewhat serious. But right now he needs some political wins and he's going to try to get some. And I think he sees the only way that he can do this is with someone like Pompeo leading the pack. And um, I think that's the one he's going to put his money on right now. Whether they'll do it or not, I mean, who knows? I hope so. I hope he gets, even if they're sort of superficial, uh, you know, <laughs> reconciliations or some kind of agreements or deals, uh, you know, I hope that something good comes out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Anything is better than the status quo. I will say I, I'm hoping for a, uh... Colonel McGregor to to take the job. I think there, you know, if that's the case, there's a real chance we could uh, knock off some of these wars and end uh, some of the the negative things going on in the world. But you know, whoever we get, uh, me and Joanne will be here talking about it. I'm sure we'll do an episode uh, at some point about the new national security advisor. So, Joanne, do you have anything else to add? Uh, I think that's it, Kyle. Thanks so much. Uh, the Swapcast is pretty fun. I think we should do it again. And um, it was great talking with you. Right. Joanne, uh, your, uh, the webpage for your show is aroundtheempire.com. And you find Foreign Policy Focus at thelibertarianinstitute.org. Thank you for listening. Special thanks to Kyle Anzalone. Follow Kyle on Twitter at K-Y-A-A-A-L-E. Find the Foreign Policy Focus podcast at foreignpolicyfocus.libsyn.com. The Around the Empire podcast is listener-supported independent media. Please pitch in patreon.com slash aroundtheempire or paypal.me slash aroundtheempirepod if you can. There are a lot of ways to listen to this show. Find it on any mobile podcast app or on the website aroundtheempire.com or on Patreon, patreon.com slash around the empire, or on YouTube, youtube.com slash around the empire. And if you're listening on YouTube, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Also follow on Twitter at around the empire. Hey, we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone.